Welcome to a special bonus episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and I'm a found footage fool. <laughs> Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. Welcome back to another episode of uh, Found Footage Fool here on The Dark Parade. Um, the only show... Uh, anywhere in podcast form dedicated to found footage movies. I haven't done the research, but I'm pretty sure that's true. So, uh, as you know, we uh, discuss a found footage film every single ding-dong time that we do this, and we are uh, applying a bit of science to this so that it's not just random thoughts. This is all applied math and, and data. Uh, so we take five criteria, and we are going to use those criteria to judge the relative success of any particular found footage film. In this case, we've got kind of a special one because this is a new paranormal activity movie. The the franchise that uh, really launched the modern wave of found footage movies. You know, you can talk about the last horror movie and, and Blair Witch. And there were certainly films that have tried to capitalize on that kind of thing. But paranormal activity really is the wellspring from which a bunch of these movies uh, were born where you just have a bunch of steady cams in a house and you capture creepy stuff so this is directed by uh, a guy named william eubank who did the very good underwater uh which was a terrific movie not found footage but a uh, really really solid kind of underwater creature feature and then written by christopher landon who uh, is the writer of a bunch of these Paranormal Activity movies, uh, as well as being the guy who uh, directed, you know, Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to You, and Freaky wrote uh, Happy Death Day to You and Freaky both. So, super talented guy. It's actually got maybe one of the best pedigrees of of any uh, of these movies, uh, of the Paranormal Activity movies. I For that reason alone, and the fact that it's a Paranormal Activity movie that's kind of throwing the previous uh, films over its shoulder and saying, like, hey, we're going to do something different. We're going to we're gonna turn this into a little bit more of a franchise and not be beholden to the story of like Katie Featherstone and all the demons and blah blah blah. I guess the ghost dimension is kind of the wrap up of all that stuff which is uh, not a very good movie uh, as it happens. So Next of Kin is uh, about a, a young woman by the name of Margot who uh, discovers that she has a family that she has never met before. She's an adopted child and so Margot is approached by this guy named Samuel, who is her like cousin or something, and says, hey, you know, I was doing this weird 23andMe thing, and we found each other, and it turns out that even though you're not aware of your family, I can take you to them. And the only thing that Margot has from her mother is the woman, presumably her mother, leaving her on the doorstep of a hospital uh, and looking very nervous as she does so. And so that is the the setup. Uh, you go to this small Amish community of the, this farm where uh, her, her family lives. And so she and uh, her film crew go to essentially record this prestige documentary is the way that they put it in the movie. Um, of this girl rediscovering her family after being given up for adoption and being a paranormal activity movie of course weird shit uh, abounds once they are given the opportunity to stay in this farmhouse uh, along with this family we discover that, that hey there's a secret room uh, upstairs in the attic and there's all kinds of weird shit uh, happening whether it's faces that they see in the mirror or uh, the, the the glass of a window uh, or it's the church that seemingly they are throwing two-headed goats uh, down into this pit in the middle of the church to feed a strange something. So, of course, all of this escalates until you kind of get the backstory. I'm not going to spoil exactly what the uh, the twist of the movie is and what's really going on. But uh, suffice to say that, you know, there's some diabolical shit afoot 
and it leads to a big, uh, you know, maelstrom of violence and, and murder uh, at the end of the film, which uh, is probably the best part, but we'll, uh, we'll let's apply our science to it, right? shall we? We have five criteria, as ever. Number one, keeping the camera on. Is there a good reason for that? Well, yeah, of course. They're doing a documentary about uh, this woman, the... Uh, finding her family and throughout the course of the film it sort of shifts in fact one of the characters actually a guy who has been in the ucb uh, a ton by the name of dan lippert who plays dale um who is easily the best character of the movie he's very funny in it and there is a temptation in the movie for uh the characters to kind of cross that line from being just like good comic relief to incredibly irritating and Dan Lippert as Dale never falls into that trap he's actually a really fun character and uh, but at one point in the movie he's like hey I thought we were doing this prestige documentary and now it lo- just looks like we're doing like bullshit ghost hunter stuff on cable but that's where the story has taken them and so I, I do think that the keeping the camera on stuff works most of the time However, uh, once you get to the end of this movie and you're just using the camera for light, essentially, there are also moments where you just don't know who's holding the camera, particularly at the end of the film when like all hell is breaking loose. And I suppose at that point, the argument can be made, well, you know, if you're picking apart who's holding the camera at that point in the film, then you're not really that into it. But... I still find it a little frustrating because there was absolutely a scene where I was like, okay, so who's holding the camera right now? Because the two people uh, that are kind of in the scene are one of them's laying on the ground and the other one is standing up screaming and I'm seeing both of them. Uh, So yeah, that was a little frustrating, but I would say in the grand scheme of things, it gets more right than it doesn't, but I still have a, a, a couple of, of nits to pick when it comes to that. All right, so on to criteria number two. That would be the characters. And I think maybe this is the best part of Paranormal Activity Next to Ken in that I sort of sympathize with Margot. I think she's a totally fine character in search of her family. Like her kind of main guy, Chris. I could never tell if they were in a relationship. I don't, that wasn't what I perceived from the film but anyway chris is probably the most irritating character and he's not terrible uh like i said dale as the um sort of comic relief of the movie is actually very very good uh samuel the amish dude who draws margo in is fun and then you have like the older elders of this amish family named jacob and lavina and they're very good it's just uh, overall like the the characters are interesting they're not entirely flat the movie is very scripted uh or it feels that way and so it's not a lot of you know hemming and hawing through the dialogue it all feels fairly sharp uh so all of that stuff is really good i think i think the characters are are pretty good in this one which leads us to authenticity is what is happening believable And for the most part, I would say it is, it definitely drops enough breadcrumbs so that when it finally explains itself, all of that tends to fall in line. It's strangely similar in some ways to Curse of Aurora, which we did just recently on Found Footage Pool. Not entirely, I mean, that's not giving anything away with the the plot of Next of Kin, they're kind of different stories. But in terms of, hey, we're investigating one thing and it turns into this other thing, um, I I find all of that to be a pretty good uh, trope in some of these movies where all of a sudden you're shifting gears to do this paranormal investigation that you never expected to be doing. And when when they explain everything, eh, you know, it's as believable as any of these, I suppose, Uh, you know, outside of like the original paranormal activity, which has such a stripped down kind of plot that it doesn't bother to explain too much. And this definitely has some, well, because of this uh, deal made with the devil, blah, blah, blah. uh, There's some of that so that there's 
a lot more ins and outs with what is happening. And by the end of it, it's like, okay, fine. If this is what you need to get to the ending, that's fine. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it feels entirely authentic because it does feel very scripted. Uh, it does not feel as natural as something like the original Paranormal Activity does. This definitely feels like a movie that you're watching. I would almost rather have that in a found footage setting than an, a Ouija warehouse situation where you just have a bunch of bad actors doing bad improv. So, eh, maybe falls down a little with authenticity, but eh, they're worse fates. Which brings us to uh, criteria number four, watchability. And that is where the scripted nature of this, it may not lend itself too much to the authenticity, but it certainly helps with the watchability. Um, there's enough stuff happening at a regular enough pace that I never found myself very bored with it. I was genuinely curious what the reveal of the movie was and getting the idea of, oh, here's what's really going on. Um, I don't know that I was entirely satisfied with the answer to what is really going on because it felt fairly predictable uh, at a certain point of like, oh, okay, well, I guess that's the move that this movie is going to make. And, and it does. And that's kind of fine. But the last 10-ish eh, minutes or so, maybe not even that long, but once it goes from a singular kind of threat to a more broad threat, that's where I found it to be the most fun. I wish there had been more of that. But I was, I was entertained the whole time, you know? It was a good day before Halloween kind of watch for me where uh, I, I was sitting around carving up some uh, pumpkins and whatnot, and it, it was a good time, you know? It was a very watchable movie. Uh, the, the acting is all pretty good. Um, there is some l laughter to be found in the movie. There's some good jokes. Uh, and when you reach the end of the movie, I thought it was pretty entertaining um which brings us to our final criteria scares is the movie very scary um i think i got one jump scare out of it but i i like a movie that descends into just utter chaos and that is the thing i like most i like the paranormal activity the marked ones that kind of offshoot of uh, the paranormal Acti activity series had the same sort of beats in it where by the end of the movie, it's just fucking crazy. And that's what I liked about Next of Kin, is that it does descend into just a funhouse of whipping the camera around and, oh, what is this? Oh my God, look over here. Look at this thing. Well, this is a real uh, how do you do. And I like that. And so I don't know that I found it to be very scary. There's one scene in particular where one of the characters goes into the aforementioned pit in this church that I think should have been scarier, and it really wasn't. I, I felt like the the scares in that moment were a little too telegraphed. It would have been nice to... Yeah, like, I'm not a jump scare fan, but you could have done a great jump scare in that scene. And also just lingered a little bit as you're looking down the pit at one point to get some more of the like inducement of dread and so yeah i just I, I feel like the scares were a little lean on this one although i still found the end of it fun uh not scary but visually interesting and so with all of that weighed uh it is a largely positive experience that i had with paranormal activity next of kin if these kinds of movies where it, it it is a bit of a slow burn, although I do think there there's enough peppered in to keep you interested, um, I'm still going to come down at about a three and a half out of five on this one. I think it's okay. Uh, I think it's better than average. Certainly in the realm of found footage, it skews towards the higher end. And, and I do like the last five minutes of the movie quite a bit. I wish there had been more of that stuff. I, uh, I know that you have to take the journey to get to that place. But I wish we had lived in that place uh, just a little while longer than we did in, in the film. Or somehow combined sort of this pursuit scenario with the rest of what was going on. Um, at any rate, I uh, thought it was uh, uh, a pretty good time. It was a, a good, you know, pull up the blankets uh, and kick back and, and kind of enjoy the, the film uh, unfolding before you. So... Um, yeah, that's where we land on this one. So we'll be back again soon 
with another episode of uh, Found Footage Fool because I can't get enough of these movies and the next one probably not going to be so good. I have a feeling that uh, after Curse of Aurora, which I thought was was pretty good and Paranormal Activity Next of Kin, which I thought was a little bit better even than that, um, we are due for a real stinkeroo. So it, it's only a matter of time. Uh, thanks very much as always for listening to The Dark Parade. Um, please, 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 if you are enjoying the show, share it around on uh, social media and most importantly, share it with friends that you think uh, might be interested. And uh, yeah, and we'll be back uh, on Sunday with a Sinister Sunday. So please join us at youtube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts, uh, where we will be summarizing some news of the week and your questions as always. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to be dipping our toes back into the well of is this person a horror master or not now that we have uh, an actual uh, rule set to judge that by and uh, that was a tremendous amount of fun so I hope you get a chance to join us drop by it usually happens about 5 p.m. central time 6 o'clock eastern time and uh, I'll see you then until next time I'm the fountain footage fool I will see you soon (laughs) 